Hey everybody, how are you guys doing? I'm Eric Gerlach, and this is another talk on logic philosophy and my favorite philosopher, Ludwig Wittgenstein. And as hard as that name is for some to say, and for me as well, in their numbers, uh, whether or not we're quantifying situations or providing logical rules to things or not, I wanted to do a couple of short and mid-length videos on Wittgenstein's later thought and I am going to be trying to condense this into metaphor by metaphor, uh, thought experiment by thought experiment. Wittgenstein is very ex famous for his thought experiments, which are simply imaginary hypothetical situations. Cultures have done thought experiments and have known that every time they think, so what if there's three mammoths? That does not mean there's actually three mammoths anywhere. And then that, where are the three mammoths? It's interesting. Wittgenstein was interested in where is our abstract, deeper thinking at all, and had a lot of very interesting ideas on that. And as he returned to Cambridge uh, in 1933, 34, and 35, he was in his middle period of his thinking. As he returned to Cambridge and famously, as I mentioned in the last video, he returns to the train station at Cambridge and says, who are all these people? Oh no, they love my earlier thinking. My earlier thinking is not what I believe in anymore. And there is a very good metaphor, a good thought experiment that Wittgenstein experiments with in his lectures uh, in two graduate students at Cambridge. And there are a couple of their notebooks, not Wittgenstein's notebooks, but these students, two of the three students' notebooks are compiled together as a book, a short book called The Lectures and Conversations. The works of Wittgenstein are actually his notebooks that he then handed off to others and said, well, publish this and arrange this as you like. I couldn't get this together entirely. And the lectures and conversations are actually not his notes. I do sometimes mistakenly say so in his notebooks, and but the lectures and conversations are technically one of the books of Wittgenstein. It's by him. But just like as I mentioned with Aristotle, Aristotle's uh, works may be his students' notes. We don't know. And actually, the Lectures and Conversations is not Wittgenstein's notes. They are his students' notes, two of his students specifically. But there is a brilliant metaphor about reducing things and people in ovens that Wittgenstein unfortunately mentions in 33-34. And he actually had to bribe uh, officials, Nazi officials and others, via middle people with gold to get some of his family out of Austria, it is said. I'm sure that was a bit hush-hush in several different ways. But Wittgenstein not only gave away portions of his, fa uh, a lot of his fa uh, fortune of being effectively a billionaire child when there weren't yet billionaires, I believe, and he then had to borrow money sometimes or get it gifted to him in order to get some of his family members out of Austria under the Nazis. So the fact that he's talking about reducing people uh, to ash or water in ovens is unfortunately foretelling, but he would not have made the sort of connections that we unfortunately can make about Jewish people fleeing Germany and Austria after the fact. Yes, or the history. All of it. We're still in. So, in a passage from the Lectures and Conversations, his students' notebooks, which are lined up in order to give us uh, notes of his lectures at the time, as he is turning from his earlier to his later work, Wittgenstein attacked the reductionist approach of Freud. You can see in these uh, lectures and conversations, he is very concerned with reading Freud, and he is very sick of Freud boiling everything down to sex. He thinks Freud is on to things as an early psychologist, one of the preeminent early psychologists, but he is very upset that Freud tries to buy, boil everything down, bile everything, boil everything down. What is this? Uh, Aristo Aristotelian humors? We're not going to be humorous here. Uh, into sex and violence, uh, Eros and Thanatos for Freud, the old gods. Again, Freud, as an Austrian Jewish guy, was trying to dress everything up in Greek for the Germans, which doesn't make him or the Germans Greek, but that is academics, academia for you. So the Germans are even more into trying to be Greek than the Anglophonic world, believe it or not. The Anglophonic world don't have as much of a clue, actually. But yes, Wittgenstein uh, proposes a thought experiment. If we cook a human being, he says to his students, he actually says Red Path is a apparently the name of one of the students. I do not believe he is a Native American tribes person. Uh, that would be amazing, but I do not believe he is. I believe he's a British uh, you know, student, and his name is Redpath. And Wittgenstein says, if we cook a, uh, what if we took Redpath here, and we cooked him down in an oven, and we're left with ash? Would that be the essence of who this is right here? Well, no. And I've entertained many a classroom with this. 
And then I go on to say, well, okay, but a human being is carbon-based life form, right? So that's the carbon of you. So if I'm like, now we know what you're going to do next Tuesday, and I listen to it. Or what if I now say, okay, well, that didn't work. We're going to get the water out of you. You're three-fifths water, right? He doesn't mention this, but this is another good thing to tack on as I do to this. Why would an oven that reduces you to ash or reduces you to water not give us the essence of what you are? Why would, would it be correct to say human beings are essentially ash or essentially water or essentially wet? And this is a bit of the fallacy of division and composition altogether in ways. And why not? Well, a human being is co a complex situation that is not reducible to a single element. And that is like your understandings of apples not being reduced to a single ordered concept or like all of your practices with bicycles or apples or anything in life being reduced to a single element as opposed to an interweaving of several simple elements that you are simple enough you can recognize them as individual things. The properties of carbon or water do not in themselves explain the interaction of the properties of water and carbon or how human beings behave or what they mean to us. It's carbon and, and water are heavily involved in everything we do, heavy, perhaps heavier of some of the elements, but if we cook people down to ashes or water, we have destroyed the complex situation and can no longer investigate how they work. It's the same with a person not being their DNA. I often mention, I forget which book, it was in a pop science book in which somebody quotes another scientist who is not an expert, actually the author of the book is a scientist, but not an expert in genetics. And they quote a geneticist saying, my genes don't give a dang about me, why should I give a dang about my genes? Which sounds harsh at first, but what that means, of course, is if I'm an ape that's programmed in ways, let's put it in quotey fingers for Wittgenstein, because there isn't really a hard program in symbols like for a computer or switches, not that simple a way that we can read it as we, uh, if we're literate, that the a person is not, just because your DNA wants you to do 17 different things, that doesn't mean you should do all of them as the ape we are. That, that you can pick and choose what you want to do. And some may, of course, have issue with altering DNA or not. Well, let's leave all those ethical issues aside and say you do and don't do what your DNA tells you to do clearly. If you accept that, then you do not reduce to what your DNA is. And if I took the DNA out of a couple of your cells, shook it in water, that would hardly be a substitute for you at a social gathering, would it? So... If I said, yeah, uh, as I say with the fallacy of composition and division, if you say, hey, Eric, come to the party, I send you my cut-off thumb, that is very disturbing. Um, that is me, it's a part of me, it's just another part of me, or Michael Jackson. But at the same time, that's not me at the party the way you asked for it. Similar to the, uh, when Wittgenstein says we call for a broom, we're not calling for the broom and the broom handle specifically, because that would be a different call, even if it effectively brought the same amount of atoms, because it's not calling for atoms either, either way, really, is not the intent directly, let's say, in such, uh, we'll leave those words vague here. So in a certain sense, you're more than D you're your DNA, you're the water, you're the carbon, you're what you just ate, you are what you eat, yes, so you are now what you ate yesterday, plenty. That's not just DNA. Obviously here we can reduce it to DNA. The point here is actually to see that thought reduces and adds things, subtracts and adds things as needed, and we can subtract away everything but your DNA. We could conveniently say you are your DNA, but that's just a convenient way of expressing some purposes, not all of them, yes? So in the same way, Wittgenstein is attacking Freud, and Wittgenstein's attack of Freud in this middle period is very important to get if you like uh, what I believe is very good about Wittgenstein, and what I'm going to further explain. Freud boils human thought and behavior down to sex. Many say just sex. It actually technically is sort of sex and violence. But very much the id as sex violence uh, origination, as this sort of fluid uh, that has a dynamic that has to be released in some kind of way. Freud actually does say in a, in a footnote to the lectures and uh, footnote to Civilization and Discontent that's like a two-page long footnote. I had to read that book as a freshman in college. It's one of the West's great books. I think they took it off the list, perhaps. But in there, he actually says, I want, uh, he speculates that cave people, men, not women, they're not capable of thought and technology so much for Freud, that, uh, yes, or hooray for misogyny, not so much. That basically, uh, the first man to, uh, that he, Freud actually claims when lightning struck, fire on the, uh, would occur on the earth, and early man wanted to pee it out because it was a sexual urge, but then, and I think there would be a lot more fire peeing websites if that were the case, but basically the first man to tuck it, uh, keep it in his, uh, loincloth and take the fire home, not the fire, I mean, 
well, sort of since, yes, is uh, was the first originator of civilization and technology. So essentially tucking and redirecting sex energy into something else or death energy is all of men doing civilization and anything scientific for Freud or anything technological. Well, that means everything is effectively sex, right? Well, Wittgenstein asks, what would Freud say is the secret meaning of an openly sexual dream? More secret sex? I mean, does sex mean sex? Does it mean violence? What does it mean? Well, if we have a nice complex... It very much is like Foucault and the capillaries of power, and Foucault being a bit of a, criti a critic of Marx and Freud in French thought as our postmodernists. It, uh, Wittgenstein fits with postmodernism, as Deleuze and Guattari knew very well. That there's a lot of sex and there's a lot of violence that can be read into behavior. That's great. And then there's sugar. And then there's spices. Alice says, and I will bring up specifically, she says, Oh, if only people knew sugar was what made people sweet. And then the Duchess comes along and moralizes poorly, and Alice is like, those are foolish rules. Those don't work. Well, no rules like sugar always makes people sweet. Sometimes it gives people diabetes. Sugar doesn't always make people sweet. Happiness do isn't always nice. Sex isn't always good or bad or procreative or not. Like, none of that is completely true. So if you try to boil down sex to procreation as opposed to happy fun, or you try to boil down civilization only to sex... Or my uh, lecture to that beeping, backing up noise that has now ended. Yes, there are many other things in our world, apparently. Like me talking more. You can't boil everything down to sex. Wittgenstein calls this, not the uh, truck backing up. He calls this, in the lectures and conversations, he says, we have to avoid the lure of the secret seller. Now, I love those words, and I love mentioning it. It's a lot, a lot like in when I was growing up in the 80s, and I think people have rehashed the cartoon. In Scooby-Doo, every episode of a TV show, David Lynch apparently was critical of this and tried to make TV shows ongoing, as a guy recently argued on the internet in, four hour, uh, in a four-hour YouTube video. In, in every episode of Scooby-Doo, you figure out what happened, you figure out the villain, the mask comes off, aha, I would have gotten away with it too if it wasn't for you lousy teenagers, and then everything's solved and now we go on. Yes, I will go on. It, it, that is not really how life works. Hopefully it somewhat does. But as Bart said in the uh, French, uh, post as the French post-structuralist, we want to see wrestling. We want to see superhero movies. We want the good guy to win, the bad guy to fail. But that's somewhat life, but not entirely. Somewhat life, otherwise we wouldn't watch it. But it isn't so simple and clean like that. So si similarly... What Wittgenstein is saying is Freud wants everything to boil down to sex and violence. Well, they're very important. Maybe the janitor's a really important character. But what if somebody lured the janitor slightly into doing the act? Then revealing the janitor under the mask doesn't tell you everything about everything, does it? And it was the one person who was at fault. What Wittgenstein is saying, and I really believe in the modern world in which we really don't complete any of the sciences entirely, as far as we know... The lure of the secret seller is every time there's a very powerful element, it eclipses everything else in the head. Uh, Nietzsche said everything in the mind loves to uh, would play God if it could at some time or other, or something effectively paraphrasing those words, and in English, not in German. Everything lures us into a secret seller where it's the underlevel of reality. I am giving thoughts about how things, emotions, and words all mix together. Now, if I did say those are simply yet not zebras at all, that would be a similar thing. I do want to present that as a wonderful model and picture of Wittgenstein, but it's not simply the whole because, again, boiling things down. We are constantly boiling things down in words. We can't completely. That is the lure of the secret seller. It's a wonderful thing to open up in your head and look around in human practices at. And I really enjoy what I call Wittgenstein's oven and right where he says, beware the lure of the secret seller. Because the oven cannot reduce us essentially to water or ash. And that explains all our behavior as an individual or a social group or a species, or animal life, or life itself, or the meaning of life, and Monty, pa or Monty Python as a familial group to each other, I hope. So, with, uh, and you also, as Wittgenstein says, cannot trust Freud reducing all of behavior down to uh, sex or violence, and thus, you also cannot trust Russell or Frege or early Wittgenstein in Wittgenstein's mind by the 30s, 1930s, which 33, 34 is when Hitler is rising. And Wittgenstein does not know about the ovens just yet, not those, at all. He was unfortunately hearing about these things, and there was nuking of Japan, etc., as he was uh, in the years before he died, which is a sad, uh, he was not so happy in a Schopenhauerian way about the world. But the lure of the secret seller is, again, 
that we can take one element or one explanation and that finishes everything off when instead what we should always look at things as Wittgenstein says in his later work like a spider web in which everything is interconnected with everything else for me to describe everything I meant in this lecture in words would be an impossible task for me to describe this room. Obviously, I collect some stuff, but for me to describe a bare room with nothing in it, in words alone, including the temperature and all the lighting, would be an impossible task. That what's, that's what we interweave eyes and sensation and emotions and motives. We can never fully describe our own motives. We cannot fully describe what a clarinet sounds like. We do not need to because it is several elements interwoven and the oven does not simply cook us down to ash or water. This is very central and important for understanding how Wittgenstein is moving into his later thinking. And then if you start to read the Philosophical Investigations, which is one of the most important works of philosophy ever written, even though it was not written to Wittgenstein's own liking, it was in notebooks he handed and said, please make more sense of this for me. And they sort of did and sort of didn't in arranging it. And people think they did and didn't arrange it well. Now, with all of that, life is a never-ending journey of amazing complexity with all sorts of different nooks and crannies, and none of these are singularly the lure, the secret seller. And so we should avoid the lure of the secret seller and beware Wittgenstein's oven, reducing any complex to a singular basement level or a single essential explana explana explanation or explanatory element. If I can speak all that out in words. And I can't. So much love, much happiness. Avoid the secret seller, as if it's some sort of horror movie. And I shall see you, as always, if I ever see you.